Hello everyone and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. This is a bit of a special edition. I've been doing this podcast since 2016, which is a bit crazy to think about. And this is the first time that I've done it in a podcast studio, in an actual studio. This is not a permanent change, but uh, my producer who's been with me from the beginning has seen his business grow leaps and bounds, Matthew Passy. Uh, he produces some of the biggest finance podcasts out there, ones that I enjoy on a weekly basis, invest like the best, Animal Spirits. I've talked about them before. But anyway, in South New Jersey, he has a podcast studio that he's opened in subsequent years. So if you're in the Philadelphia area and you're ever looking to record a podcast live, Live, uh, then I think you should do it. And for regular listeners, we also wanted to know, let you know, this will be one of the podcasts that is going to be on video. So if you choose to watch it on YouTube, uh, we will have actual images of us in the studio. Uh, and the us that I speak of is my guest, who is a returning guest, a fellow New Jersey resident. So I was happy to have him join me here at the studio. It is uh, Fide Master Karsten Hansen, who of course is one of the busiest chess authors in the business. He's got 48 books, he just told me. It was so many that I couldn't count for sure. He also writes a tactics column for Chess Life magazine, a book review column for American Chess magazine, uh, has most recently been collaborating with friend of the pod, international master Cyrus Lakdawalla. Two of their recent works include The Anti-Alapin Gambit and The Chess Wizardry of Watawa, who is a famous endgame study composer. Um, but what we're going to be talking about today is chess books is a topic near and dear to my heart and that Karsten is just has has read so many just as a chess fan and especially in his capacity as a reviewer. So the perfect person to bring in and let's welcome Karsten. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me again. I'm very, very happy and excited to be back. Yeah, this is kind of fun. <laughs> I mean, we've we've generally done it on Zoom, but and you made a longer drive than I did. It was about a half hour for me, but I appreciate it. What did it take you about an hour? Yeah, an hour plus also because the weather was awful tonight. So uh, it's about an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, rainy night here on December 5th. I think it is in South Jersey. So hopefully uh, we don't have any thunderclouds in the background. But anyway, let's get to the book talk. Um, so what we're going to talk about in this particular episode is underrated chess books. Um, now, obviously, that can be a kind of a catch all. How would what do you think of how would you define underrated, Karsten? Well, I mean, there's uh, there's the usual go tos when uh, when people are asking for book recommendations and uh, like the Duretsky's Endgame Manual and some of Agard's books and Watson's books and Nunn's books and so forth. But I would say underrated are books that are great but not frequently recommended or at least not uh, as frequently as they should be. Or it could also be books that have uh, made a big impact on on you as a reader and not necessarily be one of the um, uh, the, the the famous ones or famous authors or um, even uh, some that is not even widely available, but uh, but you think is uh, maybe should be more available than it uh, than it currently is. Yeah, I I generally agree. I I wanted this to be as liberal as possible, so I I'm gonna roll with the definition that it doesn't get it praised as much as it should. Yeah. So it could be you know it could be the most renowned book in the world, but if it <laughs> If it should be even renounder, then <laughs> then by all means, we could talk about it. And we should mention listeners and viewers, be sure to stick around because after we run down our five books each, we'll be catching up with Karsten. He's been working hard on his Blitz games. He's got all kinds of secret accounts where he's workshopping all <laughs> kinds of openings. So we'll extract some chess advice and do a general catch up about his books at the end. We also wanted to mention, obviously, I, I love chess books. I love books generally. Um, so they're near and dear to my heart. And of course, as has come up on the pod before, there's something unique about chess and book culture where it feels like I think there's been more books written about chess than certainly any other game. And sometimes it feels like any other topic. But of course, we do want to acknowledge that there's other great chess content out there as well. Of course, I'm a big fan of Chessables courses, uh, especially for learning openings and tactics. And obviously, I don't need to tell you guys to watch all the great chess YouTubers, uh, Daniel Narodisky, John Bartholomew, Levy Rosman, Daniel King, uh, some of my personal favorites, Andres Toth. But there, there's just so many great, uh, so much great chess content. So I want to give everyone their shine. But of course, this is a book discussion. But one last thing before we dive into the books, Karsten, I know we were we actually met for the first time in person last night. And now we're meeting again at a studio tonight. And you mentioned that you do check out a few chess Twitch streamers slash YouTubers on occasion. Basically, the ones that you have just mentioned, those are the ones that I'm typically uh, uh, watching. But uh, I'm more listening to uh, chess podcasts now than uh, 
I uh, I got a job where I'm actually uh, commuting to work every day, and uh, that has given me an opportunity to start checking out some of the uh, the more uh, interesting uh, chess podcasts that I n- never had time for before. And uh, there's there's several good ones, of course. There's the mainstream ones, the more familiar ones, the uh, the C squared one with uh, with uh, Christian Torilla and Fabio uh, Fabiana Carana and. Uh, there's the Chicken Chess Club, which I uh, <laughs> absolutely love, and they're big fans of uh, of this uh, podcast here as well, of course. But uh, there's also uh, like uh, I I enjoyed the Chess Fields podcast, uh, which is very different, uh, has some different takes on uh, chess that you typically don't hear, and also cover uh, typical uh, things about emotions and how you react to certain things that uh, that you typically wouldn't discuss in uh, in uh, the more mainstream podcasts and. Uh, uh, one that uh, really uh, gave me the goosebumps was uh, Jennifer Shahadi's uh, Ladies' Night uh, with uh, uh, Choco, the uh, the French champion, uh, women's champion, that had survived uh, the um, the Nazi death camps, uh, where she lost uh, basically her entire family. And uh, I mean, uh, that was just haunting and uh, and beautiful, honestly. So uh, yeah, I mean that's just some of them. But uh, otherwise, I just enjoy uh, chess content like everybody else, and the streams and YouTube, and of course uh, the live coverage from the tournaments uh, that uh, that seem to be happening constantly now. Where whereas when I was young, it was like in the newspapers, and uh, and we never really we saw never saw anything live. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's an embarrassment of riches, and and shout out to JJ and Julie of Chess Fields, and yeah, the men, the episode you mentioned with Isabel Choco um, on Ladies' Night is is just spellbinding, just yeah. quite a quite a moving story and powerful presence. Um, yeah, and the fact that there's so many other great chess podcasts, it's sort of uh, indicative of uh, the broader topic of just you know our goal here is to help you sort through this just wealth of amazing chess content in this case we're going to be talking about books but obviously you guys know there's so many other choices so on that note we appreciate we appreciate you listening and i think we should dig in to the um to the book selection. So what we're going to do is Karsten and i have selected 5 books each that we consider underrated and we'll be discussing them for a few minutes we did not tip each other off uh, to which books we selected. So we also each have a backup selection in the somewhat unlikely event that we have the same selection out of all the chess books. And we we did, the one effort I wanted to make is that it it's representative of different skill levels and interests in chess. So it's not just going to be five books that are only for master strength players. At least that's that's uh, the goal. But other than that, it's uh, we'll we'll explain as we go who would who a particular book would be a particular good choice for. But I think uh, I think we're ready to get into it. You ready, Karsten? Absolutely. Okay. Well, you drove farther, so I feel like you should get to go <laughs> first here uh, in our underrated book selection. Yeah. Okay. So the first ones I have uh, these are actually um, German books, but uh, one of them has been translated into English. I could, just couldn't find my copy. That uh, uh, I mentioned it uh, to uh, to Ben yesterday. That one of my uh, dilemmas that I have is that uh, I've moved several times and. Um, uh, so over the years, I've had to pack some of the books down. My chess library is about uh, five thousand copies, uh, and which is uh, insane. And uh, my my dearly better half, she uh, uh, really does not appreciate me <laughs> have all the chess books at, at the apartment at the same time. And also, we still have to live there. So um, uh, my my selections have also been based on what I was able to find on my right. shelf, which is typically the ones that I refer to. Also, I work with when I. Uh, when I give uh, uh, lessons to students and so on, because it's material that has uh, impacted me in a certain way. And uh, th- that's definitely the case for these two books here. Um, they are uh, written by uh, the East German uh, Grandmaster Wolfgang Ullmann and uh, a guy called Schmidt. Uh, I don't remember his first name, but it's not a Grandmaster. Um, uh, the first one, Open Files, has been translated to English, uh, was uh, published by Batsford uh, f- uh, some years ago. Okay. Um, and um, it, it's just a really good uh, coverage on, on uh, the topic of open files, how to work with them, uh, what to ignore, and so forth, and, and how they, they can impact your positions. Uh, the second one is called uh, Pawn Weaknesses, uh, which is covering all these topics about pawn structures, how to attack them, how to work with them, how to deal with them when you have um, 
uh, problems with, with your pawn structure, uh, and uh, just approach it from from different angles, both on the defending side and the attacking side. And uh, I worked through these books here, uh, cover to cover, when I was younger. Uh, actually, I can see it has my 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 dad's uh, oh, that's great. Uh, <laughs> stamp in them. Uh, they were both from 1984, uh, published by the East German uh, publisher uh, Sports Verlag. I don't think they are in existence anymore. Um, but they produced these little nice uh, hardcover books uh, on all sorts of topics. But uh, these two were two of my favorites and, uh, I mean, had a great impact on me. I, I'm i lucky enough to to read German, uh, uh, I mean, read it fluently and speak it pretty fluently as well. So, uh, so getting to these books here was not really a major problem. And the material is always accessible and uh, the material is very well chosen. So... Uh, so I really enjoyed it, um, and uh, yeah, these are two of my favorites. Wow, Karsten starting off with some extreme deep cuts. So Wolf, so Open Files by uh, Wolfgang Ullmann, and uh, of course I've heard of Ullmann, but yeah. I was not not familiar with uh, with the book. And Karsten, for for what level chess player or what type of chess enthusiast would you say this is the a good pick? Yeah, I mean, I uh, I started working with him when I was rated about sixteen hundred, okay, uh, and uh, I would say up to about two thousand. Uh, okay, great. So, uh, so I mean, uh, good club player level uh, to to uh, just below master. So um, it, uh, I think uh, the material is uh, definitely fitting that that, that bracket. Okay, yeah. excellent. So yeah, and do you happen to know? I know you said it has been translated to English. Do you happen to know if it's widely available or is it? I mean, it these? was. I don't okay. know if it's still in print. The open files one, um, okay. but uh, I would be surprised if it's not uh, available still. Okay, and it's yeah. not like a, it's not like one that goes for six hundred bucks. Or I, whatever. I really hope not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we will get to my selection. I have nothing to add because I actually have not read that one and. I'm just going to cop to it, listeners. A lot of my selections are going to be uh, from people who I've featured on the show. Uh, I've talked about this in previous book discussions. That's just kind of natural because I have a finite amount of time. I love reading chess books, but it's rare that I can read one that has nothing to do with someone I'm going to interview or a book I'm planning on discussing anyway. Luckily, we're on episode 300 something anyway. So, you know, <laughs> that, that doesn't narrow it down that much in terms of who I select. And it, it's nice to uh, spotlight the work of uh, nice people who put out great work. And we're going to start with uh, Arkell's endings, uh, Grandmaster Keith Arkell. He's, of course, um, one of the top players in uh, in Great Britain, but he's he's best known for he's got the sort of weekend warrior mentality. I mean, he's obviously he's a grandmaster, but he's not like playing on the Olympiad team. I think he's around 2,500 feet. A, and he's just made a career of cleaning up on sort of uh, lower ranked masters and, uh, you know, 2000 plus players. And he's famous for his his style of grinding opponents down, of just accumulating small weaknesses. He plays a fairly narrow repertoire, but knows his stuff inside and out, but really focuses on the end games. Um, it's published by uh, Ginger GM's publishing house. Shout out to uh, Simon Williams. Simon Williams wrote that along with Grandmaster Mark Hebden, he's the stalwart of the classic English chess weekender. Um, and I generally gravitate, for anyone who heard uh, me discuss um, Endgame Strategy with Kevin Skull, I like these Endgame books that are not just like, this is the Lucina position, you know, this is the Vancouver position, but they're like, this is how I, you know, took advantage of uh, Bishop versus a Knight or a more active piece or a more better placed King, whatever it may be. And uh, Keith's games, you can learn so much from them. Um, I have so... It's, they describe it as the art of never giving up and wearing opponents down. I also pulled a quote from Grandmaster Jonathan Spielman, who wrote the introduction. He did a, wrote a really banging intro. He writes, strong endgame play demands underlying knowledge, precise calculation, good nerves to keep yourself together for hours on end, and above all, patience. So very honest book. It's not super long, so it's a quick read. So definitely a uh, solid choice. Oh, and you should probably be rated... Definitely over 1500 USCF if you're going to read this book. And, you know, I'm 2100 and I was very at home in it. So it wouldn't hurt if you're even higher rated than that. But mainly, uh, I just find Keith Arkell, I find him as um, an inspiration in sort of like his unique approach to chess and his sort of practical approach. So uh, whatever your rating is, uh, you you can learn from that. Have you read this one, Karsten? Oh, yeah. I, I, and, I, and I quite loved it. I mean, it, it's it's very good and also very... 
uh, is consistent with his style also. I mean, uh, the, the the grinding approach to uh, to chess. I mean, uh, I, I have to say that uh, one of my my uh, few credits in, in 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 actual playing chess is that I beat Keith Arkell oh, nice. the, one, the one time in an end game. But uh, he had been so generous to give me a pawn in the middle game. Okay, and he was still playing for a win in the end game because <laughs> at the time I I didn't have an elo yet, so. Um, he and his wife had beaten uh, his then wife had beaten me earlier in the tournament in in, in a brutal fashion uh so uh so i was playing him i think in the second last round in hastings and uh yeah i beat him in a long end game uh, okay wow that's a good that's a good <laughs> thing to have on your chest tombstone <laughs> yeah. beat, beat keith arkell in an end game <laughs> excellent all right so what do you have up for your next choice garston okay. Ah, it is is a an absolute beauty. Uh, it is on uh, the uh, the 1948 uh, World Chess Champion uh, tournament in uh, in Haag and Moscow, Moscow, and uh, it's written by Paul Karras, uh, who of course uh, famously finished third in that tournament uh, behind uh, Botvinnik and Smyslov. And uh, all the games are very, very carefully annotated. It's a, a gorgeous book. It's not easily uh, accessible. I mean, I, I had to find it somewhere on the internet, mm-hmm. and uh, it was not inexpensive, but uh, it was not overly expensive either. I think I paid uh, about 50 bucks for it at the time. Um, but, I mean, it's uh, it's single column, uh, it's gorgeous, uh, a full, annota- uh, full alge- algebraic style, and, I mean, everything is just carefully annotated. It's beautiful book and for anybody interested in chess history uh this is something that you just should have yeah. especially if if you like uh, tournament books and this one is just uh, it's just a beast and uh, i was so happy when i found it it, it i mean all, i don't often buy books uh, i do on occasion and uh, uh it's usually some books that mean something uh to me and um when I found it, I was just a happy little boy. Excellent. Can I see that for a sec? <laughs> yeah, sure. So I'll tell you my background with this book. I do have it, but I have not read it. Um, <laughs> and the reason I want to see it is I believe, as you say, it's not super easy. Yeah, Verendo. That's the that's the gentleman's name. I was yeah. trying to think of the translator's name yeah. because he sells them himself, or at least he did as of a couple years ago. And I believe he even emailed me at some point and then I ordered it from him. Um, but yeah, this book is considered widely considered a classic. It's one of these books, as I alluded to with uh, my busy life. It's 500 pages and I'm not going to interview Paul Karras. So <laughs> I haven't had a chance to read it. But maybe uh, Mr. Verendo himself, uh, I should interview at some point because translating, you know, there's a lot of thankless jobs in the chess world. I've mentioned before local tournament director being high on the list, <laughs> but translator is another fairly thankless job. And uh, yeah, that's supposed to be a fantastic book by uh, by the former world champion. Um, so Next up for me is another friend of the pod, uh, Fundamental Chess, Logical Decision Making by R.B. Ramesh. Um, So to me, it's kind of funny thinking about this one because Ramesh, he's been well known as a trainer for years, but I feel like he's really blown up in the past couple years and is now like widely considered on a short list as one of the, the best trainers in the world. And of course, I've gotten to interview him a couple times. And I checked out this book initially before our very first interview. But I feel like this book doesn't get much attention considering that, you know, like someone like Agar, or, you know, another trainer of his stature, all of his books are revered. Uh, and of course, Ramesh's new book, Improve Your Chess Calculation, I feel like it's gotten a lot of buzz. I mean, it's a challenging book, but uh, he's he's always insightful. Um, and Ramesh, even though he's training top players like Pragananda, uh, he's he still somehow understands the plight. I mean, he's hard driving. You know, he asks a lot of anyone who's trying to get better at chess. Uh, you might just say that's that's the case of the truth hurting. But um, but he still he's good at understanding sort of what an adult's plight. And this is one of these books that's like it's sort of a wide tapestry of topics discovering sort of the practical side or discussing the practical side of competitive chess. Uh, So something sort of in the vein of like John Nunn's Secrets of Practical Chess, something like that. Those of you on video can see I'm turning my page over. You know, I'm used to doing this on Zoom. So uh, (laughs) usually I'm always working from an outline, even though I generally um, am not um, reading lines. But I did just want to check some notes and make sure that I'm uh, sharing some quotes from this. So one quote is many chess players often ask the question after the opening phase, I'm at a loss what to do. How do I form a plan? Ask yourself, what is my worst place piece and set about improving it? 
Um, so good, solid advice there. Uh, and here's another quote. In chess, we should see defensive moves as something of a surgery. It should only be done as a last resort. If this is the case, how are we supposed to react when our opponent threatens a pawn in our position? And each chapter has like a nice summary at the end of it. I always like when they give you the bullet points at the end. Uh, he's got tons of examples, tons of diagrams um, uh, throughout the book. Some of them are classic. Uh, some of them are more modern games. Um, one thing I will say about this book is it's it's not the easiest book to find. When I looked, Amazon had it. You're, you're a book expert. You might actually know it said something like perfect binding. So you could get it, but it said perfect binding as if like it was a distinct from a regular book. Anyway, it was 30 bucks. So slightly more pricey than a regular paperback book might be but this is a book that if you can't get it right away it's worth setting an alert for um because Ramesh is you know he's one of the best trainers out oh, there i i completely agree that's a, that's a great choice i love that book myself anything ramesh does yeah. i am I'm absolutely uh, loving it as you said it it is not for the weak at heart either i mean his is more uh, his more his recent book is also quite difficult oh yeah but uh, i mean for serious players there's so much to be gained from these here, and this one is a little bit more accessible than the more recent one here. Definitely, but, but uh, I mean, it's 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 one of these books here that that if you want to get better at chess, and if you're willing to invest some time in understanding chess and evaluating positions better and finding the right plan, it's just an an, an awesome piece of work. I uh, I'm, I'm I, I have a copy of it too. I purchased it myself too. It. Uh, um, I, uh, I hadn't received it as a reviewer copy. I think it had come out a little bit before I started for American Chess Magazine. So it was just one of those that I'm like, okay, I got to have this one here, even though my wife claims that I don't need any more books. Right. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it, it was a reviewer copy. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Karsten, I mean, I get a few books like just sent to me, but Karsten must just get absolute mountains. So it says a lot <laughs> that you would buy it. And I do want a second. It's for stronger players, but it's not as intense as his newer book and because of the topics at the end like uh, tournament preparation um, the importance of results and ratings so it's one of these books where you might like some of the chess might be over your head if you're rated below 1600 but you would get something out of it all right Karsten's got his next wet his next book teed up yeah so uh, this one here um Used to be called uh, the Complete Idiot's Guide to Chess. Uh, I I used to recommend it a lot mm -hmm. uh, for uh, for relative newcomers. It's probably a little too advanced for that. It's uh, I would say uh, Chess for Dummies is is a good introductory guide. This one is a step above uh, beyond that. It is uh, it's now called Learn to Play Chess Like a Boss by uh, former U.S. champion Patrick Wolf, and. Um, it really has everything you need uh, on any part of the game uh, to help you from, I would say, about 12, 1300 up to about 17, 1800. All aspects of the game, really great explanations, fantastic examples. And I mean, Patrick Wolf was a great chess player at the time. I mean, he worked as a second for Anand uh, when he was playing uh, for the World Championship against Kasparov. And uh, yeah, it covers openings, middle games, end games, tactics, strategy, everything. Um, uh, and I mean, anything from basic tactics and uh, basic material to a little bit more advanced stuff. And uh, I, I must uh, must admit, uh, this this is really a, a book. I mean, it's widely available. Um, it's twenty two ninety nine, uh, and oftentimes you can find it even cheaper than that on uh, some of the online stores. Uh, so um, I highly recommend it, and um, I, I think it's. Uh, uh, I, I don't think it's being recommended as often as it should. Yeah, uh, and uh, I think that is uh, falls broadly into our category here. So uh, exactly. Well, Neil Bruce and I are trying to change that. Shout out to Neil because uh, he turned me onto that book. I actually interviewed Patrick Wolf a couple years back. Really fun interview for anyone looking for an old one to listen to because he does have so many stories. And yeah, that's a fantastic book. I mean, he's because you wouldn't necessarily expect that someone who's been at that level of chess and on second playing in U.S. championships, so on and so forth, would would understand sort of the approach of an adult who comes to chess new, but I agree with your general rating assessment, but it starts with how the pieces move. So it's a book where like, if you don't know how to play, you can start with it and it escalates somewhat quickly, 
But I mean, there's it's a rich book. I mean, you can you know, you can study it for a long time. And he they're putting out new updates. You know, Patrick has a particular interest in computer chess. So he's doing separate chapters about computer chess. So, yeah. And I, I forgot to mention that I do have a list of recommended books on the Perpetual Chess webpage, if listeners are curious. And I actually tried to to not even pick ones that are on that list. Uh, but that that particular book is on that list because it's it's one of the best beginner chess books out there in my mind. So excellent choice. From a number three selection, the only book by someone I did not interview on the podcast, this one I came to honestly, uh, Instructive Chess Miniatures by Alper F.A. Ottoman. I know you've written some miniature books as yep. well, Karsten. Um, so this is sort of in the vein of Logical Chess Move by Move and some of these classic books. So it's geared towards newer players, I would say, if you're rated below 1400 or something but it's got a good selection of some of the most famous chess games of all time i mean it'll give you an introduction to games like adams against tory famous back rank game um lasker against thomas with the famous queen sacrifice but rat louis rubenstein one of the most epic combinations of all time but there's also lesser known games and it goes up to modern games so he's got some judith polgar games which at least i consider modern uh he's got a game that i used to show when i did a lot of chess classes where uh magnus carlsen beats uh yun ludwig hammer they're both like 12 years old and he mates him viciously and on the black side of a perk in like 15 moves uh so that's in there but the main thing i like about this book is the presentation and just tons and tons of explanation so if you're looking i know that especially when you're newer to chess variations don't help that much you need language to understand what's happening and this book has tons of language and you know if you do read this book and stick with chess you'll be seeing a lot of these games again and again over time but to me uh uh alper fa ataman who is a fide master from turkey he does a fantastic job laying out some of these classic games are you familiar with this one Carson? yeah i am i uh, i have bought uh, i think basically any book that has anything to do with miniatures uh-huh. uh, i i have those and um that one too i mean i i, I completely agree with your assessment i mean it's a good uh, introductory guide to uh, to tactical chess and uh and uh, he's described everything that goes on in the games extremely well and uh, not too too heavy emphasis on, uh, on on analysis, which is very good. So, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's a very good choice as well. So, uh, And one I, other thing to add about this one, uh, it's from Gambit Publications, which means you can read it on their app. It's also on Kindle. I actually... So like Karsten was saying, since we're doing this on video, we wanted to be able to, it's very important that you can hold the book. That's the whole point, right? <laughs> so even though I have tons and tons of eBooks for this one, I bought the book for 12 bucks just, to, just for, to be able to hold it like this, because I already had it on Kindle. So maybe we'll do a giveaway or something um, of the actual book. But anyway, you can get it on Kindle, you can get it in paper form and you can get it on the Gambit app. All right. What's next, Karsten? The next one is uh, is a hefty volume. Oh, boom! Here. Good choice. <laughs> yeah, by uh, by my my now frequent co-author Cyrus Lakdawala, um, and um, uh, I I uh, at first I mean he and uh, uh, Max Illingworth they had uh, created this Facebook group uh, for a chess studies composition, uh, and. Um, and I, I, I mean, I was a member, but I wasn't really an enthusiastic member to begin with. I was just like uh, curious, um, as it is with uh, many. I mean, there's so many different uh, uh, Facebook chess, uh, chess. I mean, Facebook groups on on chess, and uh, this one was too. I mean, I had never really been into studies and and chess compositions, uh, particularly uh, the mating p- uh, puzzles or problems. I never found them interesting. Um, but uh, but this w- book here, along with the uh, the Facebook group, uh, rewire your chess brain, uh, really uh, opens up something in my mind. Uh, and then of course Cyrus, he was just uh, regaling the uh, um, the importance and 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 value in uh, in these uh, uh, chess end game compositions. And I actually started enjoying solving them. Uh, I'm I'm not a great fan of chess problems still, but I. I do solve more of them than I used to, uh, especially the uh, the two movers. Um, but uh, chess endgame studies as a whole uh, has just woken something up in me, and I really enjoy the beauty in some of these compositions. Some of them are quite simple, and they're beautiful because they're simple but elegant. And then there's just some incredibly complex ones that uh, and Cyrus and I have... Uh, 
have uh, written about ourselves, uh, particularly the one on uh, on Watawa that you mentioned in, mm -hmm. in your introduction, um, which, uh, I mean, he has, uh, Aloy uh, Watawa has just composed some magical endgame studies. And when I first saw them in, uh, in the Facebook group, I... I was just like, wow, this guy is just mind blowing. Uh, I mean, the the ideas that are behind these things here are just uh, they're coming from something that I don't understand. And uh, even though I played chess for so many years and studied chess, and that uh, that that just opened something for me. And then uh, he uh, Cyrus he sent this book to me uh, when it came out. Of course, I've also reviewed it, and. Um, It's just phenomenal. I mean, it it, it really works uh, and explains why it's worthwhile uh, solving uh, both in-game studies and problems. What the value is, and what uh, Cyrus has done in this book here is that he is he he goes uh, approaches each puzzle and position uh, with a solving mindset and explains what it takes, how he's he's thinking about solving these, uh, and um, and that process alone. Uh, sort of develop something in your brain, so you sort of start seeing things in your in your end games, not just uh, uh, in the compositions, but also in your own games when you're playing. All of a sudden, you get new ideas. You see resources that you never saw before, and you see mating patterns, especially in the chess problems where uh, they don't necessarily seem like they make sense. And oftentimes the positions are so irrational that, uh, I mean, if you wipe the pieces off the board, you wouldn't be able to place them accurately right. again. But uh, just the mating patterns uh, sort of um, allows you to see opportunities in your own games also. And, and I mean, it's also very rewarding just to try to solve these things here because it is not uh, straightforward shots every single time. And sometimes it's really hidden deep in uh, in in the position how you're supposed to uh, to approach solving them and um, yeah I mean I, I a I've gotten better at it I feel like I've got become a better chess player at it and then I mean this one uh, I would say it's not an easy book and I I, I think if you are like 13 1400 you're probably gonna drown in it um, but beyond that I think you're gonna learn a lot and uh, one of the key things is that Uh, especially if you're uh, a lower rated player, you're going to say, well, I have no chance in solving this here. Right. I mean, this is uh, way beyond my level, but oftentimes just trying to look at the position, see if you can see something in, in the particular position and then saying, all right, I don't see, uh, see where they're going and then playing through the solution. Uh, you're going to learn something because you have spent time on a particular end game or a, a particular pattern and then all of a sudden things are going to pop at you much, much faster. I was talking to one of my students about some mating problems the other day, and he said he had been like spending 15, 20 minutes on these mating puzzles, and he uh, texted them to me, and I'm like, yeah, okay, that one I solved in one second, and yeah, <laughs> the next one I solved in less than 10 seconds uh, because uh, you see these opportunities much faster because you're trying to eliminate Uh, what cannot work as a defense for your uh, for the for the opposing side uh, in the um, in the chess problem. So I mean, uh, and and this book here really takes you from being a novice to starting to solve uh, serious things. And I mean, uh, if you're not sure that this book is right for you, try and dive into the uh, the uh, the Facebook group, uh, the uh, Chess Endgame Studies and 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 Compositions. Uh, Um, group there and then uh, try and uh, uh, follow along. I mean, there's a lot of grandmasters, but there's also a lot of average players and as well as in-game composers and problem composers that are part of it uh, where they just share their material and it is just first rate. I mean, really great stuff. And I mean, it's It, I, I think a lot of players would uh, enjoy themselves having themselves like mentioned next to like Alexei Shirov, I mean, uh, Judith Polgar that you mentioned Um Uh, just before, I mean, uh, she's a member of the group as well, and right. it's just you, you feel like you're an exalted company when you're there, and uh, and and everybody's welcome. That's the, that's the cool thing. Yeah, and it's got tons of members. Yeah, and fantastic choice, Karsten. I um I interviewed Car I interviewed Cyrus after that book came out, so I dove in. Um, couple things to add. Uh, Cyrus, when I talked to him, he basically getting at what Karsten was saying. He said it's not about uh getting the puzzles right. Like, so I agree. Probably if you're 1,600 or so, you're going to start to be able to get some right, and you might find that more rewarding. 
But um, Cyrus was just saying, you know, spend eight minutes per puzzle. Do what you can. Maybe you'll have the germ of the idea. Sometimes you can't get the puzzle. You can't solve the end game study, but you at least see the concept. And hence the name, Rewire Your Chest Brain. It does sort of stretch your brain. Of course, after that interview with uh, with Cyrus, I've had various uh, chest study regimens that I don't stick with. And I was going to do <laughs> two, uh, two end game studies a day from that book until I was done the book. And I made it for about a month. But yeah. then, then it fell by the way. I am working on my chest, by the way. I don't want to make it sound like I do absolutely nothing, but I'm just one of these people who once I stop and then come back, I pick up a new plan. And now I'm on to the new plan. I'm in the chest dojo uh, doing uh, the Polgar Mate and, Mate and Twos and Mate and Threes from that massive book. But I also, speaking of the chest dojo, did want to give a shout out to Kostya Kovutsky's, excuse me, Course Endgame Studies 101, which is is of a similar vein. Um, so if you prefer the digital format, you can do Kostya's course. I also think Kostya's is slightly more entry level. So if you're if you're rated below, say, 1,400, there's a few more that you can do in Kostya's course. Um, but they're both fantastic. And that being an everyman book, I believe it's on Kindle, and I believe you can also get an ebook, which I've mentioned before um, from, um, is it everyman? Yeah. From everyman, yes. if you get the ebook and you have chess base, they actually send you the PGN file. So if you're like a chess teacher or if you just like to have stuff in your chess based files, you actually get all of the puzzles presented and that you can just keep in a folder. So that's a nice perk that goes even beyond just the book. So excellent recommendation that I'm on board with. Let's get to my next one. I'm guessing you know this one because this one I think gets it's fairly well known. The Giants of Strategy by Neil McDonald. Oh, Neil, up there with you and uh, Cyrus amongst the most prolific authors in my mind. <laughs> yes, he, no, absolutely. He uh, turns them out and he's he's another one uh, similar to what I was saying about instructive chess miniatures where there's just tons of words, tons of language describing the ideas. And this is a book that is broken down by theme. So you've got like how to use the pawn ram. There's a chapter about seventh rank. There's a chapter about pawn majorities. So firmly based on positional chess, you know, the images of these uh, wizards, these famous players on the cover might give you the idea that it's presented player by player, but it's actually presented by theme. It's in ebook, it's in Kindle, um, and I would say this one is firmly intermediate. So if you're like 1400 to 1700 looking to improve your positional skills, um, I'd say it's a better book than my system, which of course is a classic. I mean, um, well, it's a classic, but that doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> um, whereas, but this one actually, I think will, will help you. And I'm, I'm a fan generally of, uh, of Neil McDonald's work. Um, um, what about you, Karsten? No, I, I agree. I mean, uh, Neil McDonald is uh, a a phenomenal coach. I mean, uh, he's one of these uh, English players that uh, that was a strong international master that became a grandmaster, and then uh, rather than continuing to uh, to try to improve on his own game, he became a, a prolific coach in uh, in the UK, and uh, he has written a bunch of really good books. Uh, that one I enjoyed a lot too. I mean, I'm I'm a sucker for positional chess. Yeah, um, I wrote a book about it myself too. But the, I mean, that one is 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 great and i mean and it is covering several of the players that i enjoy or have enjoyed uh, in in the past also both karpov and petrosian are two of the uh, the players that are being covered so i mean it, it it's a great choice and as you say there's a lot of explanations that cover these topics uh in a much much better way than some of these uh, uh so-called classics uh um, like my system, which is a book that I grew up on, uh, and some people they heavily criticize. I mean, I, I felt I learned a lot from it back in the day, but this uh, book in particular here uh, covers the concepts much better and is not being as pedantic as as Nimzovich <laughs> right. uh, or Kmok was in his uh, right. pawn play and uh, and some of the other older books. So th this one is a, is a, is a very great choice. I uh, I had uh, I completely. Uh, we need them. more car more uh, conflict, Karsten. Yeah. We keep. It Agree. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I know. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to choose. Uh, I, I have a book here that you may not have ever seen. Okay. Um, and I was quite excited when I found it myself. And, and I must admit, I've jo enjoyed it quite a bit. It is on uh, positional chess. I've um, seen it. I haven't read it. Though. Okay, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, Sean Talbot. He's uh, an English uh, international master. Uh, he became an international master in, I think, the 1970s. Uh, he was a very talented young player, and then he more or less uh, disappeared. But he sold 
uh, this book here on eBay, and I had him sign it. Oh, nice. Uh, so it was it was a nice little find. I mean, when I realized it was him and it sold it, I'm like, oh wow, yeah, that's a double bonus. Right. Uh, so uh, yeah, I I purchased. I mean, uh, it's not phenomenally thick, um, about a hundred pages, and um, but he covers a lot of uh, uh, topics uh, on positional chess and. Um, uh, I like his descriptions. There's almost no variations in it uh, that of of mention. Uh, only sometimes just to support his explanations, but not like uh, overly analyzed. And and it's just uh, it's ve- well annotated games. Um, uh, of course, mostly from the uh, 1970s and early 80s and so forth. Uh, it's by a publisher that I don't think exists anymore. Uh, they uh, they published a few. Uh, uh, Really good chess books. Another one uh, that they published back then was uh, Tactical Chess Endings by John Nunn. That was later uh, reissued by um, by Batsford and I think later on by Gambit Publications. Okay. Uh, but this one here has never been reissued. Uh, and I think it's a shame because honestly, it's it's a very, very good book. It's an easy read also. And I mean, from players rated up to 1,500, uh, from 1,500 up to about 1,900, uh, 2,000. There's a lot to be learned here, also because it it helps you uh, evaluate positions better, and I think that's one of the things that uh, modern books they struggle with. And like, for example, I would take uh, issue with, for example, no, I'm going to try to be controversial. Um, uh, move first, think later, uh-huh. uh, which uh, uh, sort of make the argument that you you just have to uh, move and then you have to think later, uh, but. Uh, that's easy to say for a strong player right. uh, that does not uh, struggle with the concept of evaluating a position. Uh, that's why you'll often see stronger players recommending it, uh, but weaker players, if they read it, they will have a harder time grasping the ideas. And I think uh, the weaker players that are embracing that book, I think they're out of their minds, uh, honestly, because I don't think uh, they actually understand why it's a good book and what the uh, what the flaws with the book is. Because if you can't evaluate a position, you can't make a good move. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, you can make a lot of stupid moves, um, but if... If if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing with your position, you uh, you're basically guessing. And uh, the the shorter period of time you think before you're making your move, and uh, the less time you you take to make an accurate evaluation of your position and finding the right plans and so forth, uh, the more likely it is that you're going to find a bad plan and and get yourself in trouble. And I think this book here, and of course I should recommend my own book, mm-hmm. Improve Your Positional Chess, uh, at, uh, that uh, Gambit Publications just recently reprinted. Uh, uh, I would recommend books like that uh, to, uh, to start with uh, because it will take you on the journey to uh, being able to embrace more complicated material. Uh, not just uh, uh, the uh, move first and think later, but also like uh, the Ramesh books and and other uh, books by uh, like more renowned, like uh, Agard, for example. Some of his books also quite advanced, uh, but also frequently embraced by lower rated players, even though they don't quite understand the concepts. Right. Uh, so if if you lay the groundwork for being able to evaluate a position, then you build the uh, the uh, foundation for what will make you a better chess player later on. Okay, let yeah. me take a quick look at that. And on the topic of Move First, Think Later by I Am Willie Hendricks, who um, I, I'm a fan of that book. It is unique and uh, it is good to, he likes the controversy. You yeah. know, he he fires some shots in his books. So. Also in my, in my book, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. I forgot about that. You were one of, yeah. It was you and there was, uh, was Selman, right? I think yeah, he, I think Selman he said and something. he's also been uh, been poo-pooing on Watson. So uh, Okay, yeah. yeah. So, so he could be a bit brusque. I had someone email me after I interviewed him saying, you know, some people say he's rude, but he's just Dutch. So that, that, that was what a Dutch person emailed me and said. That's not what I'm saying. No. But I will say, Move first, think later. Um, it's been a while since I read it, Karsten, but it's it's a provocative book. I think listeners should check it out and form their own opinion. But I will say my recollection, sort of along the lines of what you're saying, is it's not so much that he was saying like you should move first and think later. He was saying that's the human impulse. Uh-huh. He's saying whatever language is presented to someone for explaining ideas, that's not how things actually work. You might want them to work that way, yeah. but they don't. But yeah. obviously it was the the attack on you was totally uncalled for in the book so <laughs> yeah. i can understand you're, you're not uh you're not being the biggest fan but no, i no but I, I i would say that it's much easier to play good moves 
if you know how to evaluate a position. And sometimes that requires a conversation within yourself where you start looking at the imbalances, uh, where the pieces are, uh, what uh, uh, the point structure is and so on. And that is what is required to make an, a, an, a, a careful evaluation. I think that's what he had an issue with in, uh, with my book, that I, that I started a conversation that stronger players would never have. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for weaker players, that is absolutely essential to to uh, to evaluate a position accurately. So uh, so yeah, I mean, it it it, it is. Uh, yeah, I, I think we are at odds regarding that one, uh, him and I. But uh, yeah, and and that's why I think a lot of stronger players have an easier time with that book than I would say lower rated players okay. have. Okay, yeah. and it's good. You know, we always need more chess drama, so <laughs> it's, it's good, good to have you guys at odds. Um, okay. My last recommendation, and by the way, these were not in order. Uh, these were just kind of randomly presented, at least on my end. Universal Chess Training by Grandmaster Vocic Miranda, another person that I interviewed a couple years back when this book came out. He's a FIDE 2600. He trains a lot of Polish youth. Some of you may know him as he also quite prominently is the, well, not prominently, he's a behind the scenes kind of guy. But he is the trainer of the very prominent uh, Levy Rosman, Gotham Chess. In fact, he was on uh, he was on uh, Levy's pod fairly recently. Um, but very um, very serious student of the game, uh, very well read, and he presents this book in a very unique style. So uh, he kind of. Uh, similar to what Karsten and I were discussing, he kind of, I mean, he doesn't call out any books, but he just says a lot of books present the same classic games. I'm presenting all new games. A lot of books sort of prompt you for like, okay, look for a tactic here, look for a back rank puzzle, look for a deflection. Um, even even it can even be a positional puzzle where, where they prompt you like which pieces should you exchange, but his are just positions. And then you have to figure out what to do. And then the real book, the real like meat of the book comes in the answers because it's puzzles. And then the answers are the actual pros explaining it. Um, And I think he does a a really good job. I mean, it's a nice mix of positional chess tactics, prophylaxis, all mixed together. Um, This came up when I interviewed him. The only thing I would say about this book is he gives rating guides at the beginning um, that are Section A is 1600 to 1900. Section B is 1900 to 2200. And Section 3 is 2200 on up. I would say you can add at least 200 points to those estimates. And it's a fairly common uh, problem that you encounter in chess books. And and this is a serious book. So this is one that I have not done the whole thing, I have to admit. But if you're someone who's like in training mode and you just want a book that'll keep you busy for a long time and you want... And I do like the idea of puzzles that don't prompt you because that's more like uh, what you're encountering when you play a competitive game. You don't know what to look for. And that's sort of the idea that Wojcik is is driving towards. So uh, not for the faint of heart, not bedtime reading, but an excellent choice if you're work if you're say above sixteen hundred at minimum and working hard on your game. Yeah, uh, I, I would say sixteen hundred as as I, I think you you're generously low on that one. Yeah, you get mean, like none right. Yeah, exactly. And and I mean, yes, you will definitely learn a lot from the uh, working through the solutions, but that is complex material. And and I think it, it is one of the the, the general problems. Uh, uh, that books by strong grandmasters that are not used to working with weaker players, um, they uh, they create when they're writing books because they are uh, very very complex books, and I and that's why, for example, I think the Ramesh, uh, the the recent Ramesh book got uh, some criticism in some circles because the puzzles are very complex. Yeah, uh, and uh, when the publisher says, "Well, it, it's basically for anybody." Uh, yeah, that is not really uh, uh, what what most of us will experience when they're looking at it. Even grandmasters will be challenged by the Ramesh book. But it, it's it, the material is so great that somebody who's serious about chess, they're going to pick up so much from working with the material and trying to form their ideas and so on. And the the the, the book here by uh, Miranda is exactly that. I mean, it's very. Very good stuff, and I I like the fact that he has these puzzles uh, puzzles that are not prompted. I I use a similar concept in my my chess tactics books. Uh, I don't mention the players' names. I don't. Uh, they, I have hints, but I basically want uh, the reader to try to solve them without the hint, and also. 
uh, even though the, uh, my book is called Chess Tactics, there's a lot of puzzles where the tactics does not come right away. Okay. Uh, so, and uh, it's similar with these uh, positions. They're quite deep, and therefore, uh, when you work with them, uh, you, you try to, basically, it's like a game situation where you're trying to figure out what's going on before you start forming the ideas. And, uh, I mean, that's what helps you become a stronger player because you're, you're really challenged to open your mind to this particular position here and you really have no idea it's no no assessment nothing so uh it, it is tough material and for really strong players this is i mean gold right. uh, uh for improvers especially those that are working with a coach there's a lot to be learned there too because i mean and then you can have a talk about the position before you go to the to the actual solution um but you yeah, know this that, that is a great book and a great choice um um, but I wouldn't recommend it to 1600. Yeah, no. I, would, I would probably say 1900, I think, is probably the lower level. Um, but uh, yeah, anybody serious and with or with a good coach, so they will get a lot out of those books. Yeah, so. I concede the point, by the way. You're yeah. right. 1900 is a better estimate. And yeah, there's something, there's a sort of irony in that, like, there's so many chess books and so much chess material out there, as we've alluded to. We both have piles of them. We've named 10. 10 books tonight but the reality is if you are like an ambitious 2000 player and you decide you're going to do this book like i'll see you in six months to a year you know you don't need 10 chess books <laughs> you know just stick with that one yes. and it'll keep you busy for a long time yeah. so so there is this sort of fundamental tension there that everyone wants the next book this, the book that's going to unlock the secrets yeah but you've got to do the work and you know that's why i didn't finish that book <laughs> um, that's why i didn't finish cyrus's book i yeah. mean again i do work on my chess but when you're talking 45 minutes a day and some of it is spent on openings, like you don't get very far in chess books with uh, with that amount of time unless they're pros, which is why pros chess books are popular. And yeah. I enjoy them myself. And, exactly. Yeah. Books. But first, I want to talk about Karsten's own uh, chess pursuit, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, funny enough, I had never met Karsten in person, but we met last night <laughs> at, a, at a gathering in New York City and got to chat a little bit for the first time in person. And he mentioned that he's been working hard on his blitz. He's often rated 26, 2700 uh, on chess.com. So very strong blitz player. And he's seeing improvement, which is uh, obviously at that level, that's not easy to come by. So, um, so Karsten, what is it that you're doing that you think is in allowing you to, uh, to see some boosts? Well, uh, as, as I mentioned to you last night, is uh, that uh, before I started working uh, seriously with my my chess again, I I sort of hit an upper level uh, limit around uh, twenty five hundred, and I had a hard time just uh, staying afloat over twenty five hundred, um, because um, I mean uh, that's when you hit the blitz specialists. At that point, also I had mostly played uh, three plus two on uh, on uh, Lee chess. Um, uh, finding a, a, a decent volume of opposition at that level, but uh, the higher I got rated, I felt like okay, I'm I'm not getting as many opponents at that point, and also um, uh, if whenever I played three plus O, oh, um, I would just get beaten up both on time and uh, also getting uh, stressed out when uh, when the clock was lower. So. Um, and especially when you're playing on uh, chess.com, uh, I basically found no opponents that wouldn't, they wanted to play with increments. Uh, so uh, then I started playing with a 3.0 because I, I uh, 3 plus 0 because I felt like okay, uh, I need to get better at that particular skill, uh, and, and it is a skill because you're especially in the last phase of the game, you need to be able to to play really fast and also make pretty good decisions. Um, so uh, there's a couple of things. Um, one thing that I noticed was that I had a hard time finishing games. Um, and uh, uh, when there was obviously there was a king hunt going on, I was missing simple mates and so on. Sometimes I was just missing mate in ones, especially when the time was low. So uh, what I did was on, on, on Chessable, um, uh, Crafty Raff, uh, who is a uh, – yeah. um, uh, his book was just – published also the checkmate uh, patterns manual yeah, yeah. checkmate uh, checkmate patterns manual uh, was just published in in print as well in hardcover beautiful hardcover that actually I reviewed in the latest uh, the upcoming issue of um, of uh, American Chess magazine uh, and even though it's definitely not designed for players at my level uh, I found it extremely helpful just uh, familiarizing myself with the the mating patterns it, it, you just catch up you catch many more things yeah uh, and just because you're good doesn't mean you're 
see everything instantly. And especially some of the mating patterns that require several accurate moves in a row, um, you will miss some of those. Uh, so that definitely helped me. On top of that, uh, uh, just solving regular tactics puzzles. Uh, of course, the the usual um, uh, uh, the puzzle rush on on chess.com uh, i know you talked uh, in in this week's part uh, uh, with uh, dini bolito yeah. uh, that he does that basically every day uh, that definitely helped me usually when i before i start playing blitz i i, I take one or two sessions of those just to uh, to get myself uh, uh, thinking faster and seeing tactical puzzles uh, solutions faster uh, so that definitely helped and then opening wise um I, I tightened up my openings. Uh, I had I had played some online tournaments in uh, 2019, uh, uh, the European Online Championship, and uh, and a few other things. And uh, I quickly found out that my openings uh, definitely didn't work at that level. Uh, I, I quickly ran into trouble, especially whenever I played somebody stronger. I was immediately in trouble. Uh, so uh, I I I tightened up a firm opening repertoire. Uh, and uh, with the white pieces, um, uh, at first with uh, with the uh, keep it simple one d four, but also I mean uh, particularly with the black pieces I was struggling uh, pretty badly. Uh, so uh, I was talking to uh, Christoph Selecki about it, and uh, he had uh, just written his uh, uh, his course the uh, the Dirty Harry Sicilian. So I I, I picked up on that uh, and uh, started using some of his ideas, and. Um, uh, I found out that if you have some unusual ideas, uh, they don't have to be 100% perfect or 100% correct. Uh, You don't have to memorize everything. But if you have it worked well enough together that you understand the concepts and uh, and can play these uh, positions reasonably well, then... Uh, you are in a way better position that uh, a situation than you would be without it. So even an opening like the Dirty Hair Sicilian, which is decidedly not the best Sicilian uh, that is available to you, it's uh, it's one where Black very quickly in an open Sicilian where Black very quickly plays H5, uh, seemingly completely unmotivated. Um, it it has a lot of tactical ideas that people are not used to, and even stronger players. I mean, I've beaten a Grandmaster in 14 moves with with this here, and uh, that would normally not have happened uh, in in a regular sicilian but it was just there was just enough chaos on the board that he wasn't familiar with what was going on right. that he quickly got himself lost in it and uh, i i i did a similar situation when i wrote my book on the orangutan uh, where uh, it was bas- uh, basically a tribute to my dad uh, who played the uh, b4 when uh, when he was an active player and I, I told myself, you know what, uh, the least thing I can do is just to get myself familiar with the pawn structures and the ideas. So when I'm writing about it, at least I, I, I have some experience in understanding what the concepts are, what the typical situations are, what is decidedly a good orangutan uh, setup and what should be avoided. Um, and spending the time playing the games, and now I've played almost 1,500 games with uh, the orangutan in, in Blitz games, uh, including many games against uh, very strong players, I mean, highly rated players, uh, um, beating somebody that was almost 2,800 rated on Lee Chess uh, wow. with the orangutan, and um, uh, scored uh, 30 points out of in 40 games against Grandmasters, uh, uh, at least ones that are uh, have their titles next to uh, to their handles. I think it's a pretty decent score for somebody who's uh, uh, not a grandmaster by any stretch of the imagination. But uh, just the the positional concepts, once you have those wrapped in your mind and you are familiar with them, uh, then you can play the positions a lot better than what your opponents can do. So, um, and that that's 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 also what I what I try in some of my books. Just present some ideas that are not uh, have not been covered in a doesn't uh, uh, books before or uh, com- uh, grandmaster treatises on on chessable and so on. Um, people will not have invested a lot of time in it. And oftentimes I see these, especially when I play the orangutan, I see all these uh, so-called uh, refutations that uh, that uh, have been mentioned in books and. Some of them you just you just sit and rub your hands together and it's like yeah okay they, I know what's coming now and uh, because they only know the first few moves of it and you have a deeper understanding of it they are basically dancing into your territory and you can 
perform much better than you normally would because you have a familiarity with it, and your opponent, on the other hand, are dancing into to this fire pit where you really need to know where you need to step in order to survive. And uh, and and even grandmasters can make bad positional decisions in these openings here. And um, I, I share some of the games with my students and uh, some of my friends also. And uh, you can make a grandmaster look really, really pathetic uh, <laughs> uh, because they're trying to create something against something that is not supposed to be working mm -hmm. uh, or at least not working that well. And then all of a sudden they're struggling from a strategically and positionally inferior position. And then they're trying to make up for it. And that's when you can uh, come and hit them over the head with a club afterwards. So. I like it. Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah I, there's there's a lot of obviously most people listening are not going to be at Karsten's level. But I think that there's uh, there's universal advice there in terms of uh, looking for somewhat offbeat uh, openings and knowing it better than your opponent. If yeah. you if you do those two things, and especially as as has come up before on the pod with uh, modern tools, where you use something like the Lee Chess Opening Explorer to see see what actually works, um, it can go a long way. And uh, I think it's a, uh, you've been working on your Blitz game. I think it's particularly effective with Blitz um, when people have time to sort of stew and try to figure it out. Maybe they'll re react a little bit better. Which leads me to my next question, Karsten, which is any OTB tournaments on your radar? I, I had hoped to start playing uh, already last year. Um, but uh, uh, with COVID still around, I, I didn't really want to do it at that point. And uh, recently I've started a new job, so I, I didn't get started this year either. Um, but next year I'm definitely going to be playing. Uh, there's uh, several international tournaments that I, I, that, that I want to play. But obviously I need to uh, play myself warm first. So I'm uh, probably going to find some local tournaments to uh, sort of polish off my over-the-board skills and... Uh, uh, who knows? I mean, um, I, I still dream of becoming an, an international master, which, uh, I mean, uh, I would enjoy doing it at my age, which would be very uncommon, uh, right. scoring it in a classical fashion, not just by one result in a in a, in a veterans tournament, which yeah. I now qualify for. I still have a hard time wrapping my brain around that one. Right. Uh, but uh, but yeah, like uh, like um, uh, getting out there and, and, and playing some of these uh, these events is, is definitely high on my agenda. Uh, I, I haven't locked in on any because I'm, I'm working on getting my opening repertoire together in a way where I'm not going to be predictable. And uh, that's probably the, the hardest thing right now here uh, because uh, I can't remember as much as I could when I, yeah, <laughs> was, tw I was 20. Back then, I was just an engine yeah. uh, that had a lot of opening theory in it. And now... Uh, even with the uh, the modern tools, I'm still trying to uh, absorb uh, new material, and especially when it's uh, material in openings that I haven't typically been playing before, uh, because I mean that's part of my preparation. Trying to do something that I haven't necessarily uh, been exploring before, variations and so on, just to be a little bit less predictable than I have been. I mean. Uh, there's only so much you can do in the English opening, uh, mm -hmm. even though I've written many books about it. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, no, it's um, it they're they're coming, uh, cool. but uh, exactly how soon I'm not hundred percent sure about. But uh, I'm I'm I'll I'll soon test my uh, my over the board skills. For Excellent. Sure. Well, yeah, the I am chase will be fun to see. I mean, yeah. I it's not as rare for someone you know past their past age fifty as you yeah. are to get an I am title. I mean, it's still rare. To be clear, but yeah. it, like the GM, it basically never happens with yeah. IM. Uh, I know I interviewed Kari Christensen, who managed to do it. And the other thing is, obviously, if you're 2700 Blitz, let's face it, there's it's not a it's not a stretch, you no. know. Like you have to execute, you yeah. have to train, you have yeah. to be ready. But I certainly wouldn't be shocked. And in terms of like all the people I interview, everyone wants the next rung on the ladder, myself included. Mm -hmm. It's it's just human nature. Um, for some people, it seems more doable than others. But I do think, obviously, with a with the twenty seven hundred blitz rating and with all the work you do uh, writing about chess, I, I feel like uh, you could do it, and it would be fun to see. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I thank you. I, I I appreciate that. I mean, it, it, the thing is. Um, I, I did pursue the international master title when I was younger. Uh, and when I look now at those games that I played at that time where I was close to I am Norm sev on several occasions, uh, honestly, I'm, I shake my head at how I was playing at that time because I understand chess a lot better now than I used to. I mean, part of it has been the process of writing books because right. the, 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 the moment you start 
trying to explain your ideas and your concepts and how you evaluate positions uh, to players that are are weaker than yourself, but also just uh, trying to relay what's going on in a game uh, in, a, in a meaningful way, you learn a lot. And uh, that has absolutely taught me a lot of things. I mean, I, uh, after one of the most complex books that I ever had to write, uh, which was written when I lived back in Los Angeles in 2002 on the 4E3 uh, an IMSA Indian, uh, where... I thought, okay, I played the Nimsu Indian all my life and all that stuff there, but uh, the chess engines could not wrap their brains around uh, the pawn structures, uh, the double pawns and so on. Uh, and it typically, back then, the, uh, the engines would evaluate almost every position as clearly better for black. And uh, when Gligoric and... Uh, and Sokolov and uh, Bronstein in, uh, in the, uh, his book about the 1953 candidates uh, claimed a ad uh, clear advantage for white and the computers had clear advantage for black. Hmm. Clearly something was wrong. So I had to basically reanalyze everything and uh, to understand these positions and really work on them uh, on the board myself. And immediately afterwards, I found that my level increased so much. I mean, it was night and day. Up, and the, one of the best chess play, uh, tournaments I've ever played in my life was immediately afterwards, where uh, I scored, uh, I think, four and a half out of six against a twenty five hundred plus uh, rating average, um, uh, including drawing uh, Cyrus at the time. Oh, uh, nice. um, but also, I mean, many of the strongest players I beat Jack Peters uh, mm -hmm. with the black pieces in a nice game and. Uh, the only game I lost was to a Kobian um, uh, just before he became a grandmaster, and that was in the last round. So, um, uh, so yeah, I mean, it was uh, a phenomenal tournament, and that was directly a result of what I had invested in analyzing uh, these complex strategical positions. All of a sudden, my my game was just uh, expanded in in understanding, and and also just in the, in the depth of how I could play. Okay. Well, it'll be fun to see the continued pursuit, the round two. And I do, I did just want to say, I, I, for me, for someone like me, who's playing mostly weekend Swisses, I feel like being unpredictable, it would be nice, but it's not indispensable. But if you're going to be playing those norm tournaments, yeah. I do think like yeah. that's, that's super important yes. because people come ready and they're booked up to begin with. And then they come, you know, trying to, trying to guess what you're going to play. Yeah. Um, so let's bring it back to books before we say our goodbyes. So Karsten, I know you brought a few books that, yeah. you, that you said should be available in English, but are not. Is that right? Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, one of them, uh, and this is the most recent one of them, um, is, um, uh, is about Ben Larson, uh, my compatriot, uh, it is only volume one, and uh, as you can wow. see, it is uh, an absolute massive volume at uh, over a thousand pages. That's insane. Yeah, over a thousand <laughs> pages. It covers the first part of his uh, his uh, life and career up to 1965. Of course, he became a grandmaster in 1956. Uh, his first really great result after becoming a grandmaster, he won board one at the Chess Olympiad in 1956, ahead of Bud Vinick, the, the reigning world champion. Um, but in 1964, he won the first of the three interzonal tournaments uh, that he won in his career uh, in Amsterdam ahead of, uh, uh, or actually on a shared first place together with uh, Spassky and uh, I think uh, Bronstein, um, ahead of Stein and Averbach and a whole bunch of the really the top echelon. Uh, and uh, these are... All the games that were available, Ben Larson was part of creating this book here. So there are games from his early notebooks and so on. Many of them are annotated. There's wow. also many unannotated games. Uh, the annotations are taken from all sorts of different sources, uh, some of his own books, uh, some of chess magazines and so on. It is a phenomenal book, and I can't wait for Volume 2 to come out. It, we have been waiting for it for a very long time. Um, but I wish it was available in English. It, uh, I mean... Ben Larson was a fantastic uh, author, explained things extremely well. Uh, I think uh, Peter Heine Nilsson, uh, when he was on here, also talked about it. Uh, his uh, his uh, recollection of, of, I mean, uh, tiny little details was just phenomenal. I mean, uh, 
we we had him on um, in uh, this Danish chess camp for the uh, most talented juniors that Pina Heine was part of, uh, and I was also along with many others, of course. But he had just played the 1988 uh, uh, tournament in uh, Esbjerg in Denmark, and he came up and joined us. And uh, he was basically one evening he was just ent- entertaining us uh, by showing us uh, his uh, some of his favorite games. Uh, and one of them was uh, his favorite games with the uh, the A and H pawns against uh, Gligoric, I think from 1970. And uh, he uh, uh, he sent somebody into the uh, library at the school. It's, it was a it was a, a a regular school, but with a chess program, and they had a pretty hefty uh, chess library. And he was like, "Yeah, it's a, it's. I think it's volume ten, but it's the one that's like turd brown color <laughs> uh, me- with metallic." Uh, and um, he could basically just look it up. And uh, yeah, it's it's a a great game. Uh, it's not hundred percent correct, but uh, I mean, it's where he pushes his a pawn up to a six and the h pawn up to h six, right. and uh, and 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 wins a, a fantastic game there against Glickerich. And he was telling us the story that. Um, that uh, Gligorich, he said afterwards, he's like, I, I know you're going to push your pawns, but I mean, you can either, uh, you can do one or two things. You can think it is just Larsen being Larsen and not take it seriously, or you take it too seriously. And he's like, unfortunately, in this game, <laughs> I didn't take it too seriously, and I got punished for it. Hmm. Uh, so, I mean, that's a brilliant game. I think it's from 1970, um, uh, a Yugoslav tournament. Um, but, uh, yeah. Great game. The the second uh, 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 is actually two volumes, um, uh, and uh, along with the last book, also it's it's by the same author. It's by a Danish international master called Jens Enevoldsen. He was a fantastic storyteller. And these two books here, it's uh, it's called Werden's Bestes Gag. It's a uh, world's best chess. Hmm. Uh, it's two uh, two books covering. All the main tournaments uh, from the, the first official tournament in 1851 in London uh, up to uh, the 1948 World Championship tournament, the one that uh, Keres wrote about in the first book that I uh, showed tonight. And um, uh, he has picked some games from each tournament and uh, uh, telling stories from the tournaments, who won, who had a great tournament, and annotated the games. And uh, honestly, I, I have reread these books here. I think in excess of twenty times. Wow! <laughs> it, it is it is uh, it is crazy. I mean, uh, these are actually not the first copies I have. This my dad found these in a, in a used bookstore in Denmark um, because the first copies I had <laughs> completely fallen apart. Um, and uh, I mean, they're, they're, honestly, they should be published in English. They, I mean, uh, Magnus Carlsen has talked about uh, reading these books about uh, famous tournaments and uh, famous games and so on. And and honestly. Because these games that are in these books are just particularly well chosen, and they're so uh, lively annotated, which it was the uh, the specialty of Ane Um uh, it it makes them so great. Um, okay. The last one is another one by Ane Um It's called Thirty Years at the Chessboard. Uh, this my dad had it uh, bound in leather, but uh, the original cover looks like this. Oh, that's cool. Um, uh, Inevolsen may not be be widely known uh, in uh, in non Danish circles. Um, he wrote many books in Danish. I think probably in excess of thirty. Um, and this one here is uh, covers the first thirty years of his chess career, from when he was a school kid and entered a chess club for the first time together with his brother. He won a very, very famous game against Nimsovich where he basically wow. just sacrificed a whole bunch of pieces. And uh, he said that was the first time Nimsovich respected him afterwards. Oh, okay. he, he wa- uh, Ina Molsen was on um, the Danish uh, Olympia team in the 1930s. Uh, he had this great story about how he came home from the 1938 Chess Olympiad in Buenos Aires where he basically uh, stayed behind a little bit in South America and then uh, got to uh, Belgium somewhere and then started walking his way back to Denmark uh, through uh, a, a Europe that became more and more uh, Nazified at the time. Jeez, and scary. he was yeah. uh, decidedly not uh, in favor of the Nazis. Um, so... Uh, so yeah, and then uh, yeah, it ends. Uh, I think in the late 1950s, uh, he played uh, until I think uh, his last chess Olympiad was in 1970, where he was it 70 or 72, where he played against Karpov uh, and lost uh, with Black in a uh, 
in a French opening where he played this uh, very strange variation, uh, E4, E6, D4, D5, Knight, D2, F5. Whoa. Uh, and uh, got positionally punished, um, but it wasn't actually as clear as uh, as some books would have uh, made it out to be. But at the same time, he was a very old guy at that point. I mean, his career started in 1928 uh, in chess, and he was playing in 1970. Uh, I think it was uh, it was in the Seekin Olympiad. Um uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, uh, phenomenal guy. Uh, the stories are are, are great, uh, not just about the best ch- Danish chess players, but also from the chess Olympiads and so on. And yeah, uh, sounds fascinating. Yeah, very yeah. exciting. I uh, when I when I fi- I found it on on uh, first time on the shelf of somebody I stayed with during a chess tournament, uh, an old guy. And uh, he said, you should read it. You, you're going to like it because you like chess history. And uh, he wasn't kidding. And then uh, I set my dad on the on the task to find it in a used bookstore. And he found it like two or three years later in a very nice copy and had it uh, little bound for me. So uh, no, fantastic gift. So Excellent. Yeah. Well, paging Martin Eustacen, your fellow Dane. Yeah. <laughs> Someone's got to do this translation, Martin. Yeah. I, I, I nominate you. <laughs> Thank you. Because <laughs> I know you're too busy writing, writing <laughs> you know, 20 books a year or whatever, yeah. which brings us to our last topic. Karsten, I, of course, already had a few of his books, but he graciously brought eight of them here as <laughs> gifts for me, which my wife is going to have a similar reception to, <laughs> to your wife. I, I'll have to sneak them in in the dead of the night. But, uh, but if, if you were to recommend one of your recent books, I know you've been collaborating with Cyrus a lot yeah. uh, for, for people listening. Which one are you the proudest of or do you, do you find is getting the best reception? Uh, well, I mean, uh, the most recent one on the, uh, the anti-Alap in Sicilian uh, is probably one that uh, is going to connect with the most because uh, uh, Sicilian players Say, yeah, who fame, wants to fame, play against yeah, the Alpine? Exactly, the 2-3-C-2-C-3 uh, Sicilian, which is why we have like labeled it death to the 2-3 Sicilian. So it's E4, C5, C3, D, D5, D5 takes e, e, Knight F6? Knight F6, yeah, okay. which is, uh, it can become a gambit. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it it is an entertaining gambit. I mean, uh, there was an, a Dutch international master that wrote to me afterwards, and he says, I hate this variation and he had played it against uh, Varmadam the uh, the Dutch grandmaster in the in the Bundesliga and he said that he had spent so much time in the opening and barely managed to uh, to navigate it and then he was in too much time trouble to uh, being able to hold the game and then he lost it in the end so, uh, so he said even though that white might be able to gain a tiny advantage if you study it really hard and you're a strong player I mean that makes it a perfect tool for uh, for the average this player. This is if White tries to keep the pawn, or yeah, well, just in general. I okay. mean, because uh, it uh, seems that, like it, it just seems like on principles it should be equal if White doesn't. If Black yeah. gets to play Knight takes D five exactly. with the pawn on C three, and that that's the point. I mean, uh, yeah. the, the the Queen is not exposed in the center or anything yeah. like that. You capture with a Knight, and if if White tries to capture the, uh, the or keep, hang on to the pawn, then all of a sudden it becomes very challenging. Uh, the the studies books are a little more complex. Uh, the, I, I, we wrote uh, one. On first on Smyslov, we call it the Smyslov workbook. It has all his uh, in-game compositions, uh, his studies, plus the b- uh, positions from his uh, in-game book that he wrote on rook endings with Levenfish. And then we have some examples from his own games also, where, where he played particularly relevant uh, endgames. Uh, they are a little more complex, and maybe you need to be like at a rate of at least 1,700 to get the full bang for your buck. Of course, the Watava book is, has become a um, more popular than uh, than uh, Cyrus and I we had ever fathomed. I mean, it sold incredibly well. Um, That's good uh, to hear. Which surprised us because it was basically just one of those uh, uh, projects where uh, we were like, we're writing it for us uh, right. because we love uh, Watawa's work. Uh, uh, and then we hope somebody else is going to like it. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, people have really picked up on it. Uh, and I think also in part because they've seen some of the work in, uh, in that uh, Facebook group. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and it, it, it is really a lot of fun. Uh, I think those are the best. We are going to be uh, – we have several books uh, coming soon uh, that are targeted more towards club players and even – uh, almost beginners um, that we have in the pipeline. Uh, some of them are just waiting for me to uh, finalize the edits, and some of them need uh, me to put some few wor- uh, more words into it. Um, but uh, you're going to see those uh, coming fairly soon, or um, one more in December, probably of uh, Osiris and mine, and then a uh, a beginner uh, something close to a beginner's book uh, in the beginning of the new year, and. Um, 
yeah, I mean that uh, opens a different uh, chapter and what we typically write on, write about. So, mm. uh, so um, yeah, I mean, uh, I I would probably say if you're a beginner, you shouldn't pick up the books uh, right now. I uh, I would rather refer you to my book uh, Back to Basics Chess Openings. Mm-hmm. Um, that uh, is for players that I have played for a little bit, maybe rated eleven, twelve hundred and up, and. Um, uh, a lot of people have loved that one. It's by far my most popular book I've ever written. Okay. Um, and uh, then if you're a little stronger, improve your positional chess. Excellent. So, yeah. Okay. And I think the last question, Karsten, uh, again, as the reviewer of American Chess Magazine, I can't let you out of here without asking, do you have any particular favorites from 2022? Now, when I start to think about this, I can't believe, like, I have no concept of time anymore. I'm yeah. like, which, which books came out? Uh, I spent two months reading Agard's book. That was good. Yeah. Like, uh, but but does anything leap to mind for you? Uh, I mean, there, there, are, there are a lot of really, really good books. Um, I... Uh, one thing that has made me sad is that uh, the um, Elkin Ruby book uh, has not published as many books as, yeah. as he as he has done in the past. But uh, several of his his uh, tournaments, especially the ones on uh, the the masterpieces and dramas from the uh, from the Soviet Championships, um, have been absolutely phenomenal. And I mean, yeah, that, I think Magnus himself recommended yeah, those. Yeah, I would not be surprised because I mean, the the stories are so exciting. Uh, that it's it's just hard to ignore. Um, I think that uh, uh, I think those will probably be my favorites. But I mean, there's so many good ones. I t- last uh, last night after we uh, came uh, came home from the uh, the uh, the function we went to yesterday, there was a book we were waiting for me from uh, John Hilbert, a uh, brand mm-hmm. new book on. Uh, uh, an American player that was uh, that played in the 1904 Cambridge Springs tournament, and it was like a 500 page volume, and uh, the amount of research he has put into that book, and uh, I mean, uh, uncovered so many games. I mean, it's it's one of those books that I can't wait to dive into because I love chess history, and from that perspective, I think it's going to be phenomenal. Um, but uh, no, I mean. Uh, I would I would suggest to people that they they check out the column. Uh, it, I know American Chess Magazine may not be uh, in everybody's budget, but honestly, um, uh, it, it covers so many so many interesting things in uh, in the U.S. chess scene. And I mean, I'm just happy to write for them uh, and and review books. And I try to select something that would appeal to. Uh, every level uh some for strong players some for uh, more average players and occasionally for weaker players um so um yeah um yeah well it could just be the my audience but i know that when i do the perpetual chess link fest when i link to different uh news stories and blog posts and stuff whenever it's a book review yeah it, that, that gets a lot of click-throughs people yeah. book reviews i mean Yet another thankless job. So we're glad that you you weighed your way through it. And I, sorry to have my phone out. I just wanted to jog my memory of some of the books that came out in 2022. Yeah. And yeah, Michael Adams' book, of course. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, uh, is yeah. definitely uh, on the short list. And I got to give a shout out to Nate Solon and uh, Eugene Perelstein. Evaluate like a GM is a is a great. Oh great yes, book as I mean, well. I, I, and so, plus it's incredibly cheap. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's ten dollars uh, for. A phenomenal book, and it covers that topic that I mentioned earlier: how to evaluate positions. Um, I love that book. I mean, I, I think they they did a phenomenal job on that. I mean, and and for such a thin, slim volume, I mean, uh, and it only being ten dollars, I mean, it, it is a no brainer. I mean, even if it may be a little too complex for you right now, just go get it. I mean, it 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 uh, you you will never regret purchasing that book. So uh, that uh, that's uh, highly recommended on my part. Yeah, so, yeah. So thanks for reminding me of that one. Okay, so. good. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, our our heads, as always, are just swimming in chess books. Yeah. But but Karsten, it's always a lot of fun. I feel like it's even more fun to do it in person. <laughs> yeah, so, I, I agree. I so, agree. Yeah, this thanks, is, thanks this is not the last the time. Trip. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, anything to add before we say our goodbyes? No, I I'm so happy you've had me on here again here so uh i'm look, looking forward to uh, to hearing many more podcasts with you uh i mean uh when i was driving here i was listening to other podcasts all the podcasts that you, yeah that that uh that i hadn't caught up on yet so uh so yeah so just keep doing great work i'm i'm happy to come back whenever you want me excellent sounds good i don't know if we'll always be down here in <laughs> sweet recordings in 
South Jersey. Yeah. But uh, again, if listeners, anyone wants just on a whim to try out recording a pod, this place is, is awesome. So come check it out. And yeah, hopefully we can do it again sometime too. I would love to do this more often in New Jersey and Philly. There's a lot of people. I mean, I would love to have you again, but yeah. there are other people. We I can, know. We can <laughs> get out here. So yeah. thanks for listening and watching everyone. And uh, yeah, we will uh, we will catch you all soon.